Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I do hope that what I say has, has some edificatory uses. Um, the subject that I chose, John Owen on reason, faith, and the structure of human cognition, um, I think is, is important in the sense that it, 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 it underlies so much of what he is able to say about theology and, and, the, and the, the, way we, the way we know it. How, how do we know what we know? is one of the questions that he asks. And, and, and that's not something that we, we often look at in 16th, 17th century uh, reform writers. Um, but they do have a basic theory of cognition. Um, by the way, I say theory of cognition because I hate anachronisms, so I will not say, just this one time, epistemology. That's theory of cognition, works better. Um, Owen is recognized widely as, as one of the most erudite and substantial of English Reformed theologians. He evidences a grasp of literature, of theology, including works of medieval and Roman Catholic writers that was equaled by only a few other English theologians of his time, namely Davenant, Twiss, and Baxter. Uh, his life and work have been studied in detail, uh, but very few have written on his views on the natural light of reason in its relation to, to faith, um, with, with a couple exceptions. Um, the main one is Sebastian Rehmann's work. Um, Rehmann gave a close analysis of Owen's approach to the philosophical use of reason and its limitations in theology. It leads him to consider faith primarily as a divine gift by which the human being can receive and properly grasp supernaturally revealed truths, not accessible to reason. Um, and he concludes that Owen really didn't um, fully merge together or fully explain the relationship of faith and reason. I think there's an issue here. I think that Owen does in fact draw these issues out in some detail but he does it in a way that, that modern theologians looking for the traditional problem of the relation of faith and reason are not quite ready to find. Um, what I propose to do today is to examine Owen's theory of cognition in his early modern context as it relates to the basic issues of natural knowledge, including knowledge of God. Um, with the proviso, and, and you'll see from my occasional verbal references, that Owen's theory of cognition is not particularly original. Um, but then again, you know, orthodoxy isn't original either. It's not supposed to be. Um, his theory isn't particularly original. It rests largely on the peripatetic tradition, Aristotelian tradition, and was frequently in dialogue with arguments found in other Protestant Reformed theologians of his time, um, notably Matthew Hale, uh, Edward Reynolds, Richard Baxter, Richard Berthog, and among the um, continentals, you find similar reflections in Fuzius, Herman Witsius, and Francis Turretin. Um, for the sake of argument, um, I'm not going to look at this chronologically. I'm going to try to work with it topically. But I hope to show that he has a highly developed theory of cognition um, that reflects an understanding of reason, faith, and revelation that was current in the Reformed writers of his era. Um, I can locate him in his context. Um, we can see that the occasionally heard neo-Orthodox claim that older Reformed theology either lacked a doctrine of revelation or had a truncated notion of it, that's, that's, that can be disputed very easily. And in positive argument, I think the essay, the essay or lecture will demonstrate or try to demonstrate that Owen coordinated faith and reason with faith understood. And this is, I think, the key to his, his cognitive theory. Faith understood not only as the means of receiving supernatural truths beyond the grasp of reason, but, and in fact, primarily as a fundamental cognitive capacity or faculty belonging with reason to the basic process of human knowing. So, number one, theory of cognition three modes of knowing. Like many of his contemporaries, Owen often used the terms reason and light of nature synonymously and could use both terms together um, either objectively as the cognitive faculty belonging by nature to all human beings or subjectively as the process of knowing and evaluating objects. 
In either of these senses, he distinguished between corrupt or carnal reason and reason as originally constituted and spiritually renewed. He also used reason in the abstract to indicate objective principles of truth and the fundamental rationale of all things. Light of nature, he could use to indicate the natural impress of truth on the mind, accomplished either by an inwardly intuited or an externally apprehended truth. When he set out his cognitive model, Owen reflected on all these identifications of reason, initially looking to the objective and abstract usages before turning to the problem of human corruption. In his reason of faith, in explanation of the claim that scripture evidences itself as the word of God, Owen elaborated a fairly complete theory of cognition in order to show what it is, what power, what faculty in the minds of men, whereunto this revelation is proposed, and whereby we assent under the truth of it. <coughs> Owen begins by noting three basic ways in which human beings assent to anything that is proposed unto us as true and receive it as such. The most basic ascent is not a matter of reflection or analysis, but it rests on what he calls inbred principles of natural light that provide the foundation for the simplest kind of rational process, namely ascent to the truths of one's perception upon the immediate apprehension of some external thing. These inbred or engrafted principles, as identified by Owen's contemporary Theophilus Gale, consist in the most basic subjective right reason and the light or even law of nature, embodied in common principles, including principles of morality. These are common or general notions in which are comprehended the first seeds or principles of knowledge. Owen's use of the term inbred principles, moreover, points toward a particular version of the theory of a basic inward knowledge of principles or common notions that distances him from theories of cognition both among Cartesians and Cambridge Platonists, who are often noted as examples of innatism. It places his thought in proximity to such writers as John Preston, Matthew Hale, Richard Baxter, even Edward Stillingfleet, as well as continental writers like Philippe du Plessis Mornay before him, Francis Junius, Kaisbert Fuzius, Francis Turretin, and Wilhelmus Abrakel. In these writers, common notions are not innate in the sense of intrinsic being ideas intrinsic to and inwardly known in full form by human beings. Rather, they are principles, habits, or qualities inbred or implanted by God that are activated by apprehension of externals. In other words, human beings are not born with explicit knowledge of principles or common notions as if they're propositional truths that can be immediately stated apart from any relation to externals. Rather, they are truths which, of which the mind of man is naturally so disposed to receive as that upon the first exercises of sense and reason, some of them are understood without any other human teacher. These immediate apprehensions can be indirect and can therefore be the basis of supernatural as well as natural knowledge. All the knowledge is dependent on the impression of outward objects, says Owen. The common notion, or prolepsis, of God does not relate directly to any individual or specific object of sense, as would be the case with the intuitive knowledge that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. The common notion of the existence of God arises from the apprehension not of finite objects, but from apprehensions of order and causality among the objects apprehended. Given its origin, it can be identified as supernatural knowledge, albeit indirect, as distinct from a purely natural or acquired knowledge. <laughs> Owen likens this function of the human faculty of reason to a function of instinct in irrational creatures. It is immediate, and given the nature of the inbred principles, it cannot be otherwise. These principles are the most basic dictates of the light of nature, including general notions of moral good and evil, so basic that the presence of the dictate in the mind is identical with assent. Arguably, Owen identifies these notions as inbred rather than innate because, like many of his Reformed contemporaries, he denies a thoroughly Platonizing approach to knowledge, and he viewed the presence of these principles in the constitution of the mind as a divine gift, inbred or engrafted rather than simply innate. 
he would also have assumed that these notions or principles were not known per se prior to moments in which they registered in the mind as spontaneous apprehensions in relation to perceived externals. And what do I mean by that? Well, I, I was just saying somebody earlier, if you, if you, if you have a, a, a nine-month-old child who can't, doesn't speak yet and can, can barely crawl, and the child sees its favorite toy at the opposite side of a room, what does the child do to get it? The child does not go around the edge of the room, circle around the toy. The child makes a beeline for the toy and grabs it. Does the child know that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points? Well, can't verbalize it. But it's a common notion. It's there. It's a truth that's built into the head. This is the basis of knowledge for Owen these fundamental principles of reason. That, and he offers one Euclidean example, the whole is greater than the part. The truth of the principle is self-evident, not debatable, immediately appreh apprehended without further thinking. He could have mentioned other Euclidean principles, such as when equals are added to unequals, the sums are unequal. Um, if you don't think that's something that you know automatically, find two little children of the same age, each of whom has a penny, and say you're going to be nice to them, and you give one of them 10 pennies and the other 50. And they do know that when unequals are added to equals, the sums are unequal. They know that. They can't say it, but they know it. Um, arguably, Owen's reason for stressing Euclidean principles is that they could be presented in accord with his most abstract and objective line of argument. Inasmuch as they, like, unlike Stoic common notions concerning good and evil, aren't really subject to distortion by sin. Owen would ultimately concentrate, though, on the Aristotelian Stoic understanding of common notions, with principles concerning goodness, truth, and morality, including universal belief in God. The second basis for assent is by rational consideration of the things proposed to us. This knowledge is not immediate or intuitive. Rather, it is discursive knowledge derived from distinction, comparison, and he says, gathering of things. It's a knowledge of rational conclusions grounded in sense perception. It's also not a uniformly certain knowledge, he says, but it's subject to various degrees of certainty according unto the nature and degree of the evidence it proceeds upon. There are two levels of this kind of knowing. There are complex apprehensions, where you gather things together, and then there are conclusions. Ascent in this case includes certainty concerning some things and levels of opinion or persuasion concerning other things. Opinion and persuasion take into consideration objections to the truth of conclusions and recognize the possibility of error and falsehood. Opinion should be noted is a standard term for knowledge based on lesser authorities that falls short of what they would call scientia in the strict sense. Theological argumentation, in theological argumentation, revelation provides certainty. Traditionary argumentation based on human authors yields opinion of varying degrees of probability and uncertainty. The third basis for assent, and here we're still not talking about theology, the third basis for assent for Owen is faith or belief, a category of knowing that reflects, among other things, argumentation of Aquinas. But Owen, Berthog, and others add to the paradigm. Owen isn't referring here to faith in a salvific sense, but he's re referring to specifically, quote, that power of our minds whereby we are able to assent unto anything as true, which we have no first principles concerning and no inbred principles of, namely a power or faculty for assent that doesn't rest on common notions, that doesn't rest on reasoning, but is nonetheless a form of knowing, a capacity belonging only to rational creatures, a power implanted in the mind by God. Faithful assent to valid or trustworthy testimony does not rest, he says, on any certain rational conclusions drawn from principles but it also isn't mere opinion. Rather, this third kind of ascent, faith, rests on testimony, 
where, whereupon we believe many things which no sense, inward principles, nor reasons of our own could either give us an acquaintance of or an assurance of. Such assent varies in degree based on the quality or relative authority of the testimony on which it rests. Thus, faith is always an acceptance of or belief in testimony, the most basic form and lowest degree of which, he says, is the natural act of the understanding, the highest degree an assent upon divine testimony. Owen's contemporary Edward Rayner would comment that not the evidence or demonstration of what is testified, but the unquestionable credit of the testifier is the only ground and reason of faith. The assumption of a valid argument based on testimony and accepted on faith in the general sense was not unique to Owen. It underlay the reform view, among other things, of a particular genre of proofs of the existence of God, the most notable of which is the rhetorical argument from the consent of all nations. It also coincides with the assumption that the basic content of faith consists in knowledge and assent. You've probably all heard the, 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 the notion that um, even devils believe and tremble because the devils know the truth and they assent to it as true. They just aren't saved by it. But there are a lot of truths that you simply know and assent to. That's the way Owen sees the mind is working. So there are common notions, there is rational conclusion, and there is faith. His view of knowledge then argues three specific modes of knowing, each having its own proper place in relation to human faculties, and each contributing a particular aspect of the larger operation of understanding. The first mode, common notions, um, which is, by the way, is a trend, it's, it's a a cognate version of the term they use, nociones communes. Um, in Greek, it's koinai enoiai. They are self-evident truths or principia that are immediately apprehended in human rationality. That principial knowledge doesn't disoblige the, maxism, the maxim that there's nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. Because these, in, these principia are embedded in such a way as to be activated and formalized in moments of perception. Oh, and second mode consists in discursive knowledge based on reasoned collation and drawing conclusions from things received through the senses, and the third mode and testimony received from trustworthy sources. Knowledge then, generally or broadly understood, arises from apprehensions and perceptions, consistent principles, rational processes, and received testimony. Reason and faith are distinct modes of knowing that cohere in their recognition of truth, namely the apprehended truth that a thing is what it is and that what is registered in the mind corresponds with an external reality. It's, it's, it's a correspondence theory of truth, you might say. In addition to those basic modes of knowing, Owen adds a fourth category, illumination, which he defines as the internal spiritual effects wrought in and upon the souls of men. As in the case of faith, Owen indicates a natural, or at least pre-regenerate, as well as a supernatural role, specified to the attainment of knowledge of spiritual things. This supernatural role belongs with supernatural revelation. But the first degree of illumination serves materially, he says, to dispose a person to regeneration and consists in a merely natural knowledge of spiritual truths. It's accomplished through the industrious application of the rational faculties of our souls, that's a quote, to know, perceive, and understand the doctrines of truth as revealed to us. And it stands in contrast to the negligence of human beings who are given the same truths and who fail to respect them. This illumination operates at the most basic level of knowing, serving to enlighten the use of innate conceptions, namely those common notions concerning God and right living, and lead them beyond their own limits of conception. Very few persons, Owen adds, will avail themselves of this aid to their natural abilities because human nature remains locked in sin. Carnal minds live in enmity with God's revelation and reject even often this most basic illumination. But this first degree of illumination corresponds with faith. Specifically when faith is understood in a natural sense as an aspect of natural knowing. 
it will be paralleled in Owen's account of faith and supernatural revelation by a further or higher degree of illumination. So then, part two, reason, faith, revelation. Once he's outlined the light of nature, rational consideration, faith as three basic ways of knowing, um, Owen returns to these three ways in their religious or theological relationships. God uses all three ways of knowing to reveal himself to human beings, inasmuch as, quote, he hath implanted no power in our minds, but the principal use and exercise of it are to be with respect unto himself and our living unto him, which is the end of all. Owen's phrase, living unto him, is reminiscent, by the way, of Ames' definition of theology or divinity as the doctrine of living to God. And it intends to indicate that theology rests on knowledge gained not only by faith, but through inbred principles and ratiocination. As he indicates in his big treatise, The Theologumina, revelation was sufficiently accessible to prelapsarian humanity in and through the natural order itself. Owen confronted two primary questions in his analysis of reason and revelation. First, he raised the question of the grounds of belief in Scripture as the Word of God, in which teachings concerning ultimate or necessary matters were addressed to faith and required of us in a way of duty. Second, he raised the question of how the mind of God is revealed in Scripture ought properly to be understood. Owen notes that there is natural knowledge of supernatural things, and there is supernatural knowledge of natural things. But there's also a supernatural illumination required in the order of revelation for supernatural things to have a supernatural efficacy. As Rainmont pointed out, the earlier against the earlier of these two lines of argument, um, Owen was neither a fideist nor a rationalist. The threefold description of the sources of knowledge in general is the basis for describing the specific acquisition of knowledge of God. God has communicated a knowledge of himself to human beings by way of inbred or inbred principles of our nature that includes a sense of his being or existence, of his authority and will, to be understood in terms, Owen says, of natural dependence and moral subjection. These components of knowledge of God, moreover, are evident through the natural light in its power of conceiving and its power of judging. The power of conceiving aspects or components of a right knowledge of God is what the Apostle Paul identified in Romans 1.9 as that which may be known of God, namely the divine being or essence, subsistence, together with the central properties of God. These truths, Owen says, are manifest, self-evidencing, at the most basic level of inbred or innate principles. These count then as a form of revelation. And a quote, those koinai enoiai, or prolepsis, those common notions and general presumptions of him and his authority that are inlaid in the natures of rational creatures by the hand of God to this end, that they might make a revelation of him as to the purposes mentioned and are, and are able to plead their own divine original without the least contribution of strength or assistance from without. Owen insists that these common notions are the voices of God in nature, and they're in and themselves effectual in order to reinforce his argument that the words of God in Scripture are also effectual in themselves and need no further confirmation. He views words of God in Scripture virtually at the same level of these fundamental common notions. But the claim also conforms to his basic theory of cognition. There are three kinds of genuine knowledge. And the assertion of Scripture as self-authenticating is not extraneous to his general theory of cognition. You know, it's, it's, it's not as if all you've got is reason, and then suddenly along comes Scripture, and you've got faith. And, and Scripture is apparently true because of the faith. No, 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 he's saying this fits into this basic theory of cognition where Scripture is providing you with foundational principles very much akin to common notions. He sums up his argument by noting that the mind doth assent unto the principles of God's being and authority, and exceedingly to any actual exercise of the discursive faculty of reason or other testimony whatsoever. Beyond those principles, God also uses the exercise of human reason 
as a path of revelation. God proposes things to the mind, notably the works of creation and providence, which unavoidably, says Owen, lead to an exercise of reason that yields consideration of the being and attributes of God. As the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. This is not, Owen argues, a revelation directed toward inbred first principles or notions of natural light, but is directed to the mind and to the actual exercise of reason. Inbred principles function here as they're engaged in a rational exercise about the means of revelation made. Rational consideration of the order and beauty of the heavens beyond primary intuitions or common notions is necessary in understanding of the being and power of the creator. The need for rational consideration in no way detracts from the self-evidencing efficacy of revelation itself. Rather, the problem of sin enters the discussion inasmuch as human beings ignore or abuse revelation, as made clear by the divine condemnation of human beings who fail to conclude the truth of God from his revelation. Owen declares that reasoning powers, even of the wisest human beings, are in many ways defective with the result that the holiness necessary to renovation of fallen human nature isn't accessible directly without added grace. The restoration of the divine image is beyond human grasp, beyond the comprehension even of the greatest of the philosophers. The third way of knowing, faith, receives divine revelation by means of testimony, namely by the word or scripture. Raymond's quite correct in concluding that Owen's view of supernatural revelation, as delivered historically, following a kind of covenantal model, distinguishes it from other sources of knowledge. That's true. But this distinction in manner of delivery doesn't imply an alternative, purely religious way of knowing in a human subject. The historical revelation through the word, Owen adds, is not made either to inbred principles of light or to reason in its exercise, but as the Apostle Paul taught in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is revealed to that capacity of faith that we have. The other faculties and modes of knowing aren't irrelevant to the interpretation of the gospel or to the formulation of theology. Principles of natural light, exercise of reason, come to the service of faith and to the revelation that's been given to faith. Revelation affects the faculties and leads to their proper exercise. There are several ways of knowing then. So the several ways of knowing then are one and the same whether the knowledge is natural or supernatural. For Owen, faith understood as an acceptance of truth from authoritative testimony is not a mode of knowing distinct to theology. Not nor indeed are knowledge based on inward principles or the exercise of reason. To make an absolute distinction between truths of reason and truths of faith then misses the implication of Owen's theory of cognition. Faith as a form of cognition neither contradicts right reason nor operates without reasoning. Rather, it accepts on testimony evidences of truth not capable of access by natural reason through the senses, not provable by mathematical demonstration, as evidence, however, of a certainty of a higher nature, he says, and a nobler kind than that of the strictest dem demonstrations in things natural or the most forcible argument in things moral. As in his view of natural knowledge, so also in his approach to the supernatural. Oh, it indicates that there is a special illumination that variously affects the mind and makes a great addition unto what is purely natural, what is purely attainable by the mere exercise of natural abilities. This illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit. It adds clarity to the teaching of the gospel it provides a level of assent to truths of faith beyond the capacity of natural reason. The second degree of illumination, parallel to the illumination that is already there um, in the knowing of natural things, um, the second degree of illumination is not, he says, to be confused with the generation. Given that the many who are enlightened, many who are enlightened are also not converted. Regeneration requires a third degree of illumination, he says, that may also bring a sense of guilt and sorrow over sins committed. But inasmuch as human beings are endowed with these three faculties, inbred notions, capacity for rational thought, and faith, there are three ways in which God makes himself known, each of which is enhanced by illumination. 
It is therefore, he says, an aggravation of sin when human beings use any of the creation in a manner that does not respect the glory of God and God's workmanship. Owen adds that abuse of the faculties is the height of impiety, leading to unbelief and atheism among other pollutions of spirit and mind. Again, echoing Ames' definitions of theology, Owen argues that the right use of the intellect, understood either as prior to or as abstracted from the sinful state of human beings, would yield not only truth in general, but also the right way of living to God. Quote, for the powers and faculties of our minds being given to us only to enable us to live unto God. The diverting of their principal exercise unto other ends is an act of enmity against him and an affront unto him. Just as when rightly employed, the three modes of knowing agree with one another in natural matters, so will they agree when rightly employed in spiritual and supernatural matters. There is a perfect consonancy, he says, among these ways of knowing. So that, if anything pretends from the one what is absolutely contradictory unto the other, as to our senses as the means of them, it is not to be received. Given this perfect consonancy, Owen can argue that the first inbred principles are the first and necessary dictates of our intellectual and rational nature, the foundation of our whole knowledge, whether rational or revealed, sacred or profane. You can't understand supernatural revelation if you don't have those basic principles embedded in you. Accordingly, those principles provide a rule by which all subsequent claims to knowledge have to be evaluated. This is the case inasmuch as these inbred principles are from God, he says, and are endued with the marks of God's being and power. Whoever claims a knowledge or to, something to be knowledge that stands in contradiction of these principles um, is giving you not a divine revelation, but he says a paralogism from the defective reason in its exercise. <laughs> Given that the three modes of knowing all receive revelation from God, albeit from different sources, natural in the first two modes, supernatural in the third, the constants of the three ways of knowing yields not only truths of God common to natural knowing and supernatural or sacred theology, it also adumbrates the reformed assumption that truths belonging to a valid natural theology are included within sacred theology. The Apostle Paul, therefore, says Owen, rightly condemns pagan philosophers for drawing conclusions concerning God that stand in direct contradiction to inbred first principles that are provided to them in a fundamental manner. Unavoidable notions of the eternal being of God, and still they don't, they won't grab it. Even so, the conclusion of some philosophers that the world had a fortuitous beginning, or that there are fortuitous events and a concatenation of antecedent causes that is fatally necessary. All of that not only contradicts divine providence, he says, but also the first principles and notions of the natural light. Right reason can con both conduce to faith and serve to strengthen faith. Claims of revelations to faith that contradict, he says, the first principles of natural light or reason in its proper exercise are delusional. Such claims contradict the most basic and necessary assumptions concerning human knowing, the denial of which is a denial that there's any knowledge at all. Edward Reynolds similarly notes, a sense which should be grounded upon faith shall be admitted according to the conformity they have with nature and not farther. Like Stillingfleet and others of his time, Baxter does it too, Owen cites the Roman doctrine of transubstantiation as an example, a purportedly revealed truth that contradicts the most basic principles of reason. To claim that something revealed to faith is expressly contradictory unto our sense and reason, quote, in their proper existence about their proper objects is in effect to claim that the three modes of knowing are in conflict and that the ways in which God reveals himself to human beings interfere with one another. Such a claim would utterly remove certainty from all knowledge, whether concerning human or divine matters. Oh, it makes the point with regard to moral truths. There is in all men, quotation, by nature, a light enabling them to judge the difference that is between what is morally good and what is evil. This light is not attained or acquired by us. We are not taught it. We do not learn it. It is born with us. It is inseparable from us. It precedes consideration and reflection, working naturally 
and in a sort necessarily in the first actings of our souls. These declarations, though, don't place the authority of reason prior to the authority of faith. The two sources of revelation, faith and natural light, are distinct. God does not reveal himself by his word, either to the principles of natural light or to reason in its exercise. The special revelation of the word is real to faith, not to reason. The foundational mysteries of Christianity are not to be rejected, he says, because they cannot be discerned by reason. There are truths concerning God and God's work that are revealed to faith that are beyond the capacity of reason. The criterion identified by Owen concerns the constancy of the ways of knowing. The mysteries of faith, faith are beyond reason, but they're not contrary to it. There's an order to be observed among the three ways of knowing. Quote, as these means of divine revelation do harmonize and perfectly agree with one another, so they are not objectively equal or equally extensive, extensive nor are they coordinate, but subordinate to one another. The ordering of the three ways doesn't simply apply to religious or theological matters. Rather, it's a basic characteristic of the patterns of human knowing, that, for example, that there are, for example, known to reason in its exercise that cannot be known simply by means of first principles and common notions. Um, according to Owen, this ability of reason to discover truths beyond those given by the natural light explains the presence of, again a quote, many true and great conceptions of God and the excellencies of his nature that are found in the writings of ancient philosophers in contrast to other ancients who didn't employ their reason, quote, to improve the principles of natural light. It's therefore quite foolish to argue that there is no infallibly true and certain knowledge of God apart from in inbred principles or common notions, or that knowledge gained either by reason or exercise of reason or by faith and revelation should be rejected. In the first case, because such truths are not common notions. In the second sense, because such truths are not capable of being discerned by the exercise of reason. These ways, again a quote, of God's revelation of himself are not equally extensive or commensurate, but are so subordinate unto one another that what is wanting unto the one is supposed by the other, unto the accomplishment of the whole, an entire end of divine revelation, and the truth of God is the same in them all. Okay. Okay, what about the right use of all this, this reason in religion and theology? Owen brought his understanding of the relationship of reason and faith to bear in the polemics of his era in order to defend the proper role of reason in matters of religion and matters of theology, including the role of reason in the interpretation of scripture. Against the Socinians, he argued the limited capacity of reason in matters of faith, notably the doctrines of the Trinity and Christ's satisfaction. Against Roman Catholic opponents, he argued the necessity of reason to the understanding of revelation and the assessment of truth. And against still others, these unspecified, he argued a balanced use of rational discourse and argument in order to counter accusations of fideism based on his and other reform views of the effects of sin on the faculties. In arguing his position, Owen insisted that the traditional identification of the human being as a rational animal and on what he took to be the fundamental datum that whatever human beings do, including in their relationship to God and their apprehension of the things of God, they do so as rational creatures who necessarily exercise reason in matters of faith and obedience despite the impairment of reason by sin. So sinning objections to the doctrines of Christ and the Trinity as contrary to reason were in Owen's view, quote, destructive of fundamental principles of reason as also the proper use of reason in the interpretation of scripture, illustrated by the strong anti-Socinian accents in Owen's commentary on Hebrews. In arguing his case, Owen first asked the nature or character of reason, the reason to which the Socinians appealed. Scripture teaches, he says, that the spirit of man which is in him knows the things of a man, but the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. The Socinian argument, Owen concludes, attempts to use carnal reason to judge divine mysteries, or as it is by faith and prayer through the revelation of God that we may come to the acknowledgement of these things, not by cardinal reasonings of men and corrupt minds. 
It is the design of corrupted reason to debase all the glorious mysteries of the gospel and the concernments of them. Nonetheless, reason can be used. The problematic nature of Socinian teaching isn't caused by reason as such. In the abstract or general sense, reason rightly considers all objects of knowledge and allows nothing contrary to reason to be true. But reason employed by human beings, particularly in themselves, can be weak and defective, yielding conclusions that are remote from a just and full comprehension of the whole reason of things. It's not that these truths are irrational, but that fallen human reason doesn't deal with them properly. The Socinians and other critics of Christian mysteries fail to recognize that there are truths standing above reason that are not contrary to reason. This issue is not confined to theology. There are many things in the finite order, he says, that are beyond the scope of reason. The Socinians assume that a finite being with finite intelligence can fully comprehend infinite being, so as to mark out contradictions in revealed doctrine. In so doing, they fail to respect the authority of God who reveals truths to faith by testimony. And they misconstrue the powers of finite reason and undermine reason itself. The ultimate being of God, he says, is absolutely above the comprehension of our reason, but is revealed in the authoritative testimony of scripture, it's an object of faith and reason can work with the statements of scripture. Even so, the Socinian objections are not actually valid objections to the original revelation of God, which is the principal object of faith, but only to various human explanations of the truth. Objections to explanations of a truth, even objections that cannot be easily or distinctly answered, are not grounds, he says, for abandoning the truth. Yielding to such objections ultimately leads to atheism. There is, Owen implies, a simple counter to such purportedly rational objections to the doctrine that divine oneness is not contradictory to threeness. And he notes the vestigia, namely resemblances of trinity and unity that are found in nature, and render it, quote, most unreasonable to suppose that to be contrary to reason, which many objects of rational consideration do more or less present to our minds. At greater length, and with another natural analogy, Owen argues the truths of God are not rendered questionable by the inability of human reason to discern them fully. He notes the harmony that exists in the created order. This too is not entirely discerned by human reason, not even by the wisest human beings. There is no agreement about the movement of the stars and planets or about the relation of causality and efficiency among things here below, he says. New discoveries, he notes, show how little human beings comprehend the universal order of things. Still, although the harmony and order cannot be absolutely comprehended, all living creatures live, live according to it and look to it for their preservation. It's there. Even so, there's a harmony in all parts of the mysteries of God that the Socinians deny because they both fail to comprehend it by means of the principles of natural reason, and they also lack the wisdom of faith that is necessary to recognize the harmony of God's work. Socinians, in effect, posit a view of natural reason commensurable with human capacities under the original covenant made with Adam, um, and they refuse to recognize the necessary role of grace in the right exercise of the intellect. In debate with Roman Catholics, and this, this one's always more fun, um, yeah, Socinians aren't fun, but the Roman Catholic debate sort of is. Owen broached the issue of the use of reason in a relatively brief response to the Roman Catholic polemicist John Cain, who wrote a book called Fiat Lux in um, 1661. Owen's animate versions on this book were answered by Cain in the following year, and Owen responded in a massive vindication of his original treatise. Um, Owen was prone to overwhelming his adversaries with words. Um, if they didn't like the short treatise, didn't oblige it, he would give them something so big that they couldn't work their way through it. Um, yeah. It was an era of the reestablishment of episcopacy in England and of rising intolerance of nonconformity. Cain took advantage of this situation um, to argue tolerance of Roman Catholicism. His title, Fiat Lux, drew on the claim of the obscurity of religious truth 
and, it, and the attendant inability of human beings to set themselves up as arbiters of religion. No sect, he claimed, hath any advantage at all over another, nor all of them together over popery. Mm. Accordingly, there could be no rational motive for disputes and animosities about matters of religion. Moreover, reason itself was obscure, not a sure basis for determination of religious truth, and certainly no basis for a person to contend against a religion that had existed for above 1600 years in the world, at, and whose head the Pope is a, quote, unerring guide in matters of religion and faith, unquote. Owen, that, well, that did tick him off. Um, Owen responded that if Cain could persuade Protestants first to throw away their Bibles, and then to discard reason, there is no doubt but then that then they shall become Roman Catholics. Cain's claim concerning the obscurity of reason assumed the arbitrary exercise of reason on the part of the individual. But as Owen countered, Cain's argument only served to plead reason against itself, an utterly unreasonable tactic. He knows full well that he hath no difference with any sort of Protestants about finding out a religion by reason and adhering only to its dictates in the worship of God. Protestants, he said, base their religion on God's revelation and recognize that a person lacks the ability to judge the particulars of religion so revealed. Echoing what he laid down his theory of cognition concerning faith and reason, Owen insisted that it is rational to accept revelation as true. This is the sovereign dictate of reason, that whatever God reveals to be believed is true, and as such must be embraced, though the bottom of it cannot be sounded by reason's line, and that because the reason of a man is not absolute reason, but being the reason of a man is variously limited, bounded, and made defective by its ratiocinations. Quote. There can be such a sovereign dictate, as Owen would indicate in his reason of faith, given that inbred principles or common notions themselves embody divine revelation, and when rightly employed in discursive reasoning, don't contradict the truths of revelation. Accordingly, although reason can't produce concerning God, independent of God's revelation, reason must be employed in, asserting, in assessing what has been proposed to it by rendering judgment concerning its meaning and use. What has been revealed in the scripture as God's truth, he says, has been proposed to the minds and wills of men for its entertainment by the ministry of the church. And a quote, an objective truth our reason presupposes that all it hath to do is but to judge of what is proposed to it according to the best principles that it hath, which is all that God in this kind requires of us, unless in that work wherein he intends to make us more than men, that is Christians, he would have us make ourselves less than men, even brutes. Reason is a gift of God. Obedience to God requires that believers use their reason, um, and what is not done reasonably is not obedience, he says. Um, Owen and Baxter both point out that reason itself can look at what Scripture says about the Lord's Supper and then look at what Roman Catholics say about transubstantiation and note that you really cannot separate properties from things. It is not as if one perceives properties and not a thing with them. You can't simply perceive properties, odors, appearances of bread and wine, and not perceive the actual bread and wine that's there. By the same token, it's impossible to perceive a substance without its proper qualities. It's impossible, well, if someone were to ask you, and this is paraphrasing, but someone to, to, to ask you, so I'm thinking of something, and the thing that I'm thinking of um, can be in many places at the same time, and when it's in those many places at the same time, it doesn't have any properties by which you could recognize it. What am I talking about? You would not say a body. 
I'm sorry, you just wouldn't. That absolutely violates the fundamental principles of rationality. Contrary to Keynes assumptions, Protestants make judgments concerning meaning and truth. If the use of reason is permitted the way Cain wants it to be used, or the, if the use of reason is not permitted, as Cain seems to claim, the result, Owen says, is a herd of beasts. It's not a church of human beings. His, war warnings, his warnings concerning the coining of religion by reason amount to a red herring intended to deny reason its proper place in religious matters. Nothing, Owen comments, is more nauseous to him than magisterial dictates and sacred things without an evident deduction and confirmation of assertions from scripture testimonies. The proper function in matters of religion and theology of discursive reason is a servant, ancillary, albeit necessary the work of interpretation of scripture. To prove that interpretive point, Owen indicates logical argumentation in scripture itself. He notes in particular the issue of reading Hebrews 4, 3, where entrance unto eternal rest is predicated on belief or faith. There's a logical argument, he says, present in this text that rests on the rule of the excluded middle, where possibilities are represented by immediate contraries, such that the denial of one constitutes affirmation of the other. The apostle's statement that those who do believe enter into that rest carries with it the implication that those who do not believe do not enter into that rest. Just as clearly as when a person declares that it is day, he says, and carries the implication that it is not night. His point, we may take notice of the use of reason or logical deductions in the proposing, handling, and confirming of sacred supernatural truths or articles of faith. For the validity of the apostles' proof in this place depends on the certainty of the logical maxim before mentioned, the excluded middle, whose consideration removes its whole difficulty. And to deny this liberty of deducing consequences, or one thing from another, according to the just rules of reason, is quite to take away the use of scripture, and to banish reason from those things wherein it ought to be principally employed. Scripture then provides the source and norm for all Christian teaching, but the religious and theological norms presented by biblical revelation must be understood in and through the normal pattern of operation of the rational faculty, reflecting on the implications of its inward principles, its acquired knowledge. The limitation of the natural operation, given both the finitude and sinfulness of human beings, is such the supernatural truth is beyond the powers of reason to attain unaided. But even in supernatural matters, the structure of human knowing remains, and otherwise inaccessible divine truths received by faith from the biblical testimony can be recognized as true because conformable to God-given inbred principles and the results of this rational process. That's basically what Owen is telling us. Some conclusions. Owen's several arguments concerning cognition reveal a fairly detailed and robust understanding of principles and operations of the intellect and of the necessary inclusion of testimony and faith in the natural order of knowing. Given his inclusion of faith in his basic theory of cognition, he was able to argue that the knowledge of religious and theological truths, the interpretation of scripture, and the ascent to mysteries that are above reason offered no exception to the normal processes of human knowing. It's not a miracle that you deal with theology and you come to some kind of understanding of truth. It's the way reason works when properly exercised with the proper input, namely the proper understanding of scripture and the use of reason to interpret it. Owen agreed with the general line of reformed thought he insisted that natural and supernatural truths stood in agreement, and that God-given supernatural truth would not conflict with God-given rational truth. He added the point that faith and the acceptance of testimony are characteristic of the rational process in general, as well as of the apprehension of supernatural revelation. Examination of Owen's thought as representative of a high orthodox reformed approach to the problem of the knowledge of God 
also argues against the rather typical neo-Orthodox complaint that Reformation and post-Reformation Protestantism equated revelation with supernaturally revealed doctrine found only in Scripture, and that it lacked a proper doctrine of revelation. Evident in Owen's work is a full-orbed understanding of revelation that is arguably quite representative. Owen clearly did not view revelation as an event, and he didn't confine revelation to Scripture. In accord with his general theory of cognition, he assumed two forms of, of revelation, two forms of natural revelation, in fact, the most basic in the inbred principles of the mind, the next in the natural order as examined by human reason. And then he also assumed knowledge acquired by supernatural revelation, received by faith as authoritative testimony, did not require a new faculty or an abridgment of the fundamental process of knowing. Stated simply, Owen assumed a single theory of cognition from the perspective of the human subject, consisting of inbred or engrafted common notions, acquired knowledge from both sense and testimony, and received by both reason and faith, and capable of being developed by ratiocination, reasonable discourse. Accordingly, supernatural knowledge differs from natural knowledge not because of the basic structure of human knowing, but because of its objective and outward sources and because of the measure of illumination or grace required of the knower. There you go. End of story. Um, I hope all that cognitive stuff didn't drive people crazy, um, but it's imp I think it's important to recognize that these reformed writers do have a full-blown theory of the way the human mind works, receives true knowledge, whether by revelation, or by simple rational processes, and that there is a divinely given humanity that is constructed so that it receives this knowledge and works with it. Okay. Questions? Objections? Critiques?